morning. morning. Let's take our hymnals and turn to 570. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. We'll sing the first and the third. 570. Maybe a cappello. I will sing of my Redeemer.
we don't sing that one a whole lot. <laughs> Let us turn to 479, a little more familiar, face to face. This morning, I was thinking uh, how fortunate it is that we can come to Sabbath school instead of partying on Friday night and getting up and sleeping till noon. Uh, <laughs> you, you see people do that, and then all weekend, then Monday comes, and they've got to go to work. Aren't you thankful for the Sabbath? Yes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this day, for your guiding us into this truth. Father, we thank you for Jesus and for his love and for his redemption. In your name, amen. Mary asked me to have a special feature. <coughs> If I say the word discrimination, what comes to your mind? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Un unfair. Unfair. Race. What was that? Racism. Gray. Race. Oh, oh, okay. Race. What else? <coughs> Anyone have any definition? Impartiality? Are they impartial? Not really, are they? If you're partial. If, if, you're, if you're prejudiced, you have your mind made up one way, don't you? Usually. What's some examples of discrimination through, through history and your life? Americans. America? The Samaritans. Okay, the Samaritans. That, that's one. Okay. How about uh, Civil War? Was that discrimination? Was that over discrimination? How about World War II? What was the cause of World War II? You can think of all kinds of discrimination. Pardon me? Glass ceilings for women. Yeah, you know, I looked at a magazine just recently, and on the front it says, uh, let's see how it word it. It was a Bible text. Um, God created neither male nor female. Is that right? Yes, He did create 
Yeah. 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 But they're equal, right? According to that text. Is that not right? <clears throat> but in the article it says women's place was primary, secondary education. That was it. Secretarial. And that's as far as it would go on women. Is that discrimination? Yes. See, if, if God calls whoever, a man or a woman, to a ministry, and we disagree with that, does that make, does that make them wrong? It makes us wrong. See, what happens if God gives you a call and you don't fulfill it? In the same way with music, we find some good musicians. Now, I'm not talking about rock. <clears throat> but someone goes out in a ministry of music, and you say, man, I can't stand that music. But yet God has called them to that particular ministry. Are we to judge them? I want to talk to you about uh, a discrimination that I'm well familiar with. If I say the word osteopathy, what does that mean to anybody? Doctors. Doctors. Who said that? Okay, Nalita, thanks. I worked for two osteopaths after I got out of the service uh, in, from 62 to 69. And they could not use local hospitals unless it was a county hospital. If it was government-funded hospital, they could get in. But any other hospital, they weren't welcome. <clears throat> and uh, I used to get some calls at City Hall. And this uh, <clears throat> lady whose husband was the head of the family practice residency at the university was trying to place doctors into small communities so that they could work out their medical education bill. And I said one day to her, I says, uh, how about osteopaths? I think when we came here, I, I know of one or two osteopaths in the whole state of Arkansas. She says, you know, we have found that they are very good practitioners. Amen. You know, and I thought, well, that's interesting. A few years ago, well, let me go back. In the mid-60s, until then, osteopaths could not serve as doctors in the military. Did you know that? They were not allowed to practice their, their profession. Now, the osteopathic schools had uh, medical doctors as a lot of their instructors. Used the same books, everything. Allopaths or medical doctors believe that all sickness comes from the outside. Osteopaths believe that a lot of illness is from the inside. So osteo being bone, wh where does the stem cells come from? Does anybody know? Bone marrow. Bone marrow. There's a lot to do with the skeletal system that, that they have forgotten. Anyway, in mid-60s, I was working at the clinic, and finally, the first osteopath was allowed to serve in, in the armed forces as a physician. And evidently, they picked the right guy. And the doctors, one of the doctors I worked for, I knew him, said, Bob, they picked the right guy. He said, he is an outstanding physician. And uh, so that kind of turned that around. And then, uh, in about 67, I was working at the clinic, and my dad was working the light company, and I would go down and meet him, and we would moonlight and do some tree work at night. Well, coming back, we, uh, Marilyn and I was coming up the road and coming down the hill. Was a member of the Pontiac Bonneville, the convertibles, the beautiful Pontiac Bonneville. We seen one, and all of a sudden, things went up into smoke. And there was four boys in that car. It was just the, about the 3rd or 4th of July. I guess it was the 3rd of July. One of them was a dot lawyer's son. One was an advertiser's son. I can't remember who the other two were. What happened, they were throwing firecrackers out and the console was full of firecrackers and, and it got lit. And there was guys jumping out of that thing, you know, every direction trying to get loose. Well, one of them, I think it was the lawyer's son, got a broken leg. I mean, it was a compound fracture. And so I went over to help him and uh, I'd been on a lot of calls with the doctors, so I kind of halfway knew what to do. I was raising his feet up, and some guy says, can't do that. He's going, he, he's, you, you just don't do that. And I said, well, wait a minute. The guy's so in shock, he's going to lay there and die if we don't get some blood to his head. You know, you've got to get blood to his head, you know. So anyway, called the ambulance. They came, picked him up, went to the hospital. <clears throat> Our two doctors went in and, and uh, worked on him. And, and uh, just as we got him loaded in the ambulance, take him up to Iowa Methodist Hospital, We'd call this one boy's doctor was, was a medical doctor, and we'd call him and ask him to come. You got to get here quick because these boys got to go. We just got ready to put him in the ambulance. He came and he started unbandaging what one of the osteopaths had bandaged. And he said, Wait a minute. He says, We're just patching up to get him up to Iowa Methodist. They got to have emergency care. So we got him up there, and Dr. Eggs says, Bobby, why don't you ride with us? So I rode with him, and we were in the waiting room, and pretty soon one of the doctors came out and said to Dr. Eggs, his name was Jim, said, Jim, I am really sorry 
that I can't let you go in that emergency room with us. He knew Dr. Eggley. Dr. Eggley, Dr. Eggley was considered the doctor in Iowa who had sent the most correct diagnosed patients to Iowa State or the University of Iowa Hospital, which is a medical school. So he had a good reputation. He says, I'm sorry, because he's an osteopath, he couldn't go in and help treat him. Is that, is that discrimination? Yeah. Yeah. Big time discrimination. These guys are well qualified. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we had a lot of uh, things happen. Uh, they finally got into the military, finally got into all the hospitals. Now, in northwest Arkansas, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, some of the leading physicians in this part of the state are osteopathic physicians. Dr. Armstrong, the neurosurgeon, if you ask anybody who's top, it's him. You go to Mercy for uh, colonoscopy, most of the doctors say, this is the number one choice, an osteopath. Now, fortunately, in, our, in Oklahoma, the osteopathic uh, school has become a part of, the, of Oklahoma State University. So that's given them a little bit of a boost. But I want to talk to you about that because there's nothing worse than discrimination. And sometimes we are wrong, even when we think about it. You know, because a lot, of, a lot of people just say osteopaths. They used to tell me they don't have enough education to be a doctor. They got the same education as a medical doctor. They, their schools are just as good, Mary. Chiropractic. Spinal manipulation. Yeah. Incidentally, uh, osteopathy started in 1895, and that's when chiropractic started. Just give you a little history. You know how they discovered osteopathy? Any idea? Anybody have any idea? Doctor, St who became Doctor Still, was out working, and he had a terrible headache. So for some reason, he just strung a line across a couple of posts, and he laid his head on to see if he could get the pressure off. Well, something. And so uh, that was the first adjustment that anybody knows of. From then on, he said, there's, there's got to be more to this than just, you know. So it wasn't back problems like most of us think about osteopaths and chiropractors. It was a headache that, that was, and the chiropractor, Dr. Andrew Still and Dr. Palmer were in the same building. The same, they had joining offices at one time. Now, one thing I've noticed, and I've checked and checked, Sister White, no place has ever said that uh, there's anything wrong with osteopathy. Now, she lived 20 years after osteopathic medicine became known. Now, she didn't call it quackery. She didn't call it anything. Now, wouldn't you think if it was quackery, she would have said something most likely? I would have sure thought so. You know, don't go to those guys. It's quackery. But anyway, um, just to give you an idea of, of how far discrimination can go and what it can do. Mary? You know, even internal medicine, Dr. Meehan, he's a DO. DO. And he does wonderful yeah. Our OB doctor, yeah. Dr. Thompson, was a DO. Yeah, there's a DO over at Centerton that's supposed to be one of the leading physicians in this part of the state, too, who's a DO. Uh, what's his name? Uh, I forgot what his name is. But. Uh, no, uh, Pineville? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so they're becoming pretty prominent. And, uh, oh, I was going to tell you. Uh, there's a doctor over at Rogers that's daughter is going into going to osteopathic school. And now osteopath students can have a choice whether they want to go to the osteopathic school in Oklahoma or if they want to go to the University of Arkansas, they give them a choice. So see, finally it's come around where people recognize that that it's what I always said, it's not the degree. It's how kind of person you are and how much you care about people that, that makes you good or, or I shouldn't say bad doctor but uh, I've, you know doctors I worked for and I got to close down here the doctors I worked for were known to to diagnose patients that other doctors missed you know why they did that we did more blood counts and more urine tests than any doctors in the world I think I was running the lab and I tell you what Blood count after blood count, differential after differential, because the way you find out what's wrong with patients is you do the lab work and see so you don't wait three or four days and say, well, I had some doctors in North Iowa used to call on and they, they were friends, but they didn't agree on practice of medicine. One of them says, well, if they don't get better, they'll be back in a few days. And the other guy said, let's find out what's wrong with them. Which one would you rather have for your doctor? Yeah. See, and these guys were known to be very thorough the practice of medicine. Uh, 
one time we had a young girl that was sleigh riding uh, and she was going down the hill and she came up, up under a parked car. They brought her out to the clinic and we did some tests on her. Dr. Herman said, Bob, call, uh, call Dr. So-and-so in Des Moines. We're going to send this girl up there. It says, I think she's, she's fractured her liver. And you know, most doctors wouldn't even, they'd just wait a few days, you know. A few days later, a letter come back and said, this little girl was very fortunate that she had a doctor who recognized this little girl had a fractured liver. Because otherwise, overnight, she might have been dead. See? So anyway, that's just a little bit about discrimination and what discrimination can cause. And then once it comes around, you realize that those guys aren't quacks. They're top-notch physicians. Thank you. Good morning. Does anybody know if we, I seen a dry erase board here last Sabbath? I think it was. It's in this room here. Thank you, Jack. <coughs> you know, usually we discriminate against other people when their ideas aren't the same as ours, don't we? That's that's really what happens. Oh, yeah, brother. There, can you hear me? All right. How many anybody? How many? Uh, how many people know what the lesson's about? What is it about? Temptation. Has anybody been tempted already this morning? <laughs> I think we could all raise our hands, couldn't we? <clears throat> Thank you very much. Now, hopefully, we have some markers that work. I remember when uh, somebody, uh, I, I don't know her name, but she always, is that uh, Bob's daughter? Yes. Was teaching, she was having a terrible time with those markers. But, okay. I'm going to open up with a little a reading here in the, in the Sabbath school lesson. And uh, some of you maybe already read it. I don't know if it's in your, your edition or not, but maybe just in the teachers. I don't know. But it says, A nickel perverse, that was the deal young Barry's mother made with him and his brother. For every Bible verse memorized, there were five cents closer to their goal of buying a big Snickers candy bar or a Sugar's Baby, a soft, chewy milk caramel candy. In order to reach their goals faster, the boys comb through their Bibles looking for the shortest verses to memorize. But one day, memorizing Scripture became more than just a way to buy candy. When I was 13, remembers Barry, I memorized Proverbs 1.10, which says, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. That very day, two young men from my neighborhood asked me to help them get back at somebody. I felt, I felt the power of Proverbs 1.10 reverberating in the corners of my spirit, and on the strength of that verse, I refused to go with them. They didn't just get back at someone, they murdered somebody. Barry said their sad saga was played out on the evening news, and the judicial decision was life in prison. One of the gentlemen, in fact, the gentleman who asked me to go along said, but I didn't do it. The other guy did it, but it didn't make any difference. They both received the penalty of life in prison. This means that I, if I had gone along with them, even if I had stood there quoting Scripture, I would have received the same penalty. Does anybody know who Barry is? Barry Black. He's the uh, chaplain uh, currently. I think, I thought it said on here how many, I think it was in the Senate, yeah. Um, I'm not sure how many chaplains there have. I thought it said, but how we respond to temptation is important, isn't it? Could have changed Barry's future forever. And not all temptation changes our future forever, but it does change us, doesn't it? <clears throat> 
This uh, somebody does somebody mind reading for for us James chapter one verse twelve? It is our uh, memory text for the day. James one twelve. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Blessed is the man that endures. It says right. Yes. Blessed is the man that endures temptation. When he is tried, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord promised him. You know, we've all experienced it. We resolve not to give in to temptation, but in the heat of the battle, our resolve melts, and much to our own sense of shame and self-loathing, we fall into sin at times. Sometimes it seems that the more we focus on not sinning, the more powerless against temptation we feel. And the more hopeless our condition appears. We wonder if we indeed are saved at all. It's hard to imagine any serious Christian who hasn't wondered about his or own, her own salvation, especially after they've just fallen into sin. Have you experienced that before in your life? I know I have. Maybe you're experiencing it now. But no matter how many times you've let yourself down, and no matter how many times you've let God down, no matter how weak you are in moral power or in slavery to doubt, the good news is, there is good news, isn't there? The big question is not, can I be victorious? The Bible's straightforward on that one, isn't it? The big question is, how can I be victorious? Uh, let's turn to uh, John chapter 15. Look at a few verses before we get into today's lesson completely. John 15 and verse 5. <clears throat> Can I get a volunteer to read this verse? John 15, 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. So Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. If He's abiding in you, what's the promise there, Ken? It'll bring forth fruit. You'll bring forth not just a little fruit, but much fruit, huh? Apart from Him, Ken, what can you do? Very, very little. What does it say? Yeah. It says nothing. Not even just a little bit, can we? It says you can do nothing. So what is nothing? Have you thought about that? What is nothing? It's like, I heard somebody say it's, it's when you take the peeling off of the zero. It's nothing. <laughs> nothing is nothing. I don't want to leave you just on that verse. Let's turn to Philippians. This is a well-known verse. Philippians 4 and verse 13. Some of you probably have this one memorized. Somebody else read for me? I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. So in this verse, how much can we do? Everything. All things. The last verse says, apart from Him I can do nothing. But this verse says, through Him I can do all things. So, what is the natural conclusion of this, Roberta? That we need Christ on our side. Yes, who's doing the all things? Christ is doing the all things. It's not a little bit of us and a little bit of Christ, is it? It's Christ doing the all things. And that's really what Christian maturity is all about, is learning how to let Christ do all things in our lives, isn't it? <clears throat> James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and verse 13. Talking about temptation and enduring temptation. James 1.13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and He Himself does not tempt anyone. Does God tempt us? Why is it important for us to know this, that God doesn't tempt us? Because if He could, or if He did, 
we would have, we would not have the ability to have these powers. Okay, excellent. What is another idea behind this? If God was the one that tempted us, what does that suggest about God? He's evil. Uh, yeah, excellent. It suggests that God is evil, isn't it? And He knows evil, which maybe that sounds familiar to, uh, especially would sound familiar to Eve, huh? In the Garden of Eden. God's, he said the same thing to her, didn't He? Not only is God not the author of evil, He's not the source either of temptation. What is the source of temptation? And you can find that answer in verse 14. Look at James 1.14. Somebody read that, please. But each man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. So what is the source of temptation then? Yeah. Yes, excellent. Evil itself is the source of temptation, isn't it? And we are evil, aren't we? The problem lies from within us. And that's the reason why it's so hard to resist temptation because that we're the problem. Trust me, Satan doesn't have time to be in every single person's house in the world all the time, does he? We... We blame Him for everything, but really we are born with a sinful nature. And we are responsible for our own choices, aren't we? Verse 14 and 15. Uh, in the lesson, it clearly answered a question. The question in being, is temptation sin? Let's look, let's look at verse 14 and 15. If I could have somebody read that in James chapter 1. Well, I read 14. Do you mind reading 15? Sure. It says, Each man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. Then the lust, when it hath conceived, beareth sin. And the sin, when it is full grown, bringeth forth death. So is temptation sin then? It becomes sin, according to the verse... When you yield to it. Or it, when lust has conceived, then it says it gives birth to sin. That's when sin is born, right? James clearly separates temptation from sin. Being tempted from within is not sin because even Jesus was tempted, wasn't He? And yet He was without sin. The problem is not temptation itself, but how we respond to it. Having a sinful nature is not an in of itself sin. However, allowing that sinful nature to control our thoughts and dictate our choices is. Lust brings forth sin and sin brings forth death, the verse says. Why with such high stakes before us, when we know the results, do we not have victories that should be ours? Why do we rationalize sin away in our lives? Because that is a very dangerous game to play, isn't it, in our minds. I um, wanted to illustrate something on the board about sin <clears throat> and the cycle of sin. It's kind of like this. We have sin at the top. When we make a mistake, how do we, what does that lead us to? after we make that mistake how do we what are some things that we might feel after making a mistake remorse okay what else guilt excellent Bob we would feel guilt uh, most people when they make a mistake especially if it's a big mistake they feel guilty about it they feel very guilty about it what does that lead to then okay excellent what else Okay, let's, let's not go there just yet. It should lead to repentance, but what else could it lead to? Separation? Depression? That, yes. Depression in people's lives? What else? 
Discouragement, okay. But sometimes we try to cover it against it. Well, and that's the, kind of the next step, which um, it also leads to stress, doesn't it? And it sometimes it uh, leads to even suicide. We're almost there. And anxiety, doesn't it? Do you run into people that are experiencing these types of symptoms? Have you experienced these symptoms? <laughs> and then it does lead to destructive habits, doesn't it? It does lead to destructive habits. What are some of those destructive habits? Drugs, drinking. Okay. Drugs and alcohol. Ken said one. What did you say? Suicide. Did you know suicide is a top ten killer in the U.S.? Being a mortician, I, I know real well. Yeah. What else does it lead to? What are some other things that we do to try to, to cover up? We lie. Okay, leads to lying. Lying to ourselves most of the time, huh? Or sometimes to others, too, so they will not know what we have done. Mm-hmm. Behavior. Okay. Yes, like anger and things like that. What else? There's many things. There's a period there between the ill and depression that's, that you rationalize and you uh, uh, blame other people. There's a period before you go into this to the depression that that uh, you you don't feel that bad yet. Mm-hmm. Between Guilty. <clears throat> now let's see. Well, who's to blame for this guilt? Certainly not me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you look for someone, you know, to blame. So there's a period there, but you, you just don't jump from guilt way down there. No, there's some things that do happen in between, right. um, and, and also I guess probably in between here as well. You know, between this step and this step. You know, uh, and sometimes they they intertwine as well. Uh, they intertwine. What are some other things that people turn to? Um, you know, how about work? You think people would turn to work? But, you know, they get so busy and just, let's just try to, let's just work so much so that my mind's not on this so I don't have to deal with this m mentally and address the issues. And, and that looks okay. Mm hmm Blame yeah. 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 Divorce, it does lead to divorce. Broken relationships uh, in people's lives. And really, you know, we could make a, a very big list here and we could say, well, you know, this list, this applies to everybody that's not in church. But really, to be honest with you, I've ran across people in my experience in church that have done all of those things right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ex you know, sometimes, you know, people attend church as well to uh, to try to cover up what's happening and the way they feel and thing about things in their life. You know, people um, give tithe. Not that giving tithe is wrong or bad. God tells us to give, but we do turn to those types of things too, don't we? There's all kinds of good things that we can turn to that people turn to to try to eliminate this in their life. And really, the thing, it's just a key, the cycle just continues. It just goes around and around and around. So if we want to break this cycle, what do we have to eliminate? Say that a little louder. We have to eliminate sin. We have to eliminate sin. At its root, Sin begins with distrusting God. Did you know that? At the root of sin is distrust for God. It's the same method that Satan used to deceive a third of the angels. It is the same method that he used 
on Eve in the Garden of Eden. Which is also the same method, that very successful method is the same method that He uses today on us. You believe it? If He can get us to distrust God and to take our eyes off of God, He's winning. As long as our eyes are on Jesus and we're focused on Jesus and what He can do, who's winning then? We are. And we're experiencing what in our lives? Happiness and victory over sin. Let's turn to uh, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. You know, I run into people that have the idea, well, I'm, I'm going to do things my way. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't want nobody controlling me. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. Have you ever ran into people like that? Myself. Yourself. <laughs> and you know, we think we're doing, we're making all of our own choices, and, and we are, we do make our choices but we think we are in control of ourselves. And let's look at Romans chapter 6 and verse 16. <clears throat> Could I get a volunteer to read this? Romans 6, verse 16. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death, are of obedience resulting in righteousnesses. So you are a slave to the one that you obey, correct? What are the two what are the two powers in this verse that want to control us? Give him a mic so he can say that. The one power that he sees sin is sin. So we're either a slave to sin. Which is transgression of the law. Okay, and what else could we be a slave to? Obedience to the law. In the verse it says? Obedience. Obedience. To what though? Which leads to righteousness. To righteousness. Oh. That results in righteousness. And if we look at verse 13, Paul just kind of restates what he's saying in verse 13. He says, Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as an instrument of unrighteousness, but instead present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So it's really quite simple, isn't it? On one hand, we have sin that wants to control us, and on the other hand, we have righteousness that wants to control us. Are we controlling ourselves? Yes or no? You make the choice. We make the choice our choice is what though? Who we let control us. We're just an instrument. Now I can't play the piano, but I mean if I would say, well you know I'd like you to play a song for me, will it do it? It won't. Somebody that knows how to play is going to have to come up here and play this piano. If the piano is going to make music. It's an instrument, isn't it? We are instruments. Somebody has to play us. Of course, God wants to be playing us, but He doesn't force Himself on us. And Satan wants to play us, and if He could force Himself on us, He would, wouldn't He? And we're given a choice. Now, Sylvia, you had your hand up. I was just going to say, the difference between the two is that Jesus doesn't force us and Satan. He wants to force us, but God doesn't let Him, does He? We all get a choice. <clears throat> Look at verse uh, 17 and 18. <clears throat> Could I get somebody to read this one? Uh, Tom, you had your hand up just a second ago. Do you mind doing this? these two? 6, 17, and 18? Yes. But thanks be to God that through you, that, but that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. So why do we, why do we have this choice? 
There's a reason why we have a choice according to these verses that Tom read. Why do we have this choice? Who gets the credit for us getting, getting this choice now? Yeah, it says, but thanks be to God. God and what He did is the reason why we now have a choice, right? For who gets to play music through us. Because we've been freed from sin. And of course, God freed us from sin. I have a question though. If we've all been freed from sin, why does sin still exist in churches today? Why do you think that is? Who said that? Could you say that again and just louder? Our lack of belief. Our lack of belief. Do you believe her? Yes. Some of you are nodding your heads. It's exactly the, the case, isn't it? Unfortunately, so many people in different churches, they can't even get along, can they? Have you ever been into a church where you know two individuals you know were fussing and fighting and they would try to avoid each other? Yeah. Is that the way God intends it to be? I, I'm going to tell a little story. We had a minister in North Dakota that we liked real... We had a minister in North Dakota we liked real well and he got transferred to uh, one of the churches up in uh, Canada and he wrote back, he said... Two of the members hadn't spoken to each other for years. And he said, actually, in church, they got into a fist fight mm. while he was there. Mm. A fist fight in church. Imagine that. <laughs> I would have a heart attack if that happened. <laughs> I couldn't, I mean, wouldn't that shock you? Oh, yeah. But you know, this is not the first story I've heard about that happening at a Seventh day Adventist church, believe it or not. Actual fist fights. Somebody had a hand. How Here's what I wanted to share is that our success evidently comes with the time we spend with Jesus because mm. Jeremiah 49, 19 and Jeremiah 50, 44, they're identical verses. He says it twice. When the swelling of the Jordan comes, which we know is the end of the world, so it's especially for us. Mm -hmm says, who will be my shepherd? Who will give me the time to be like me? To grow like Jesus, I think it takes time with him. Excellent. Right? Amen. Um, a failure to believe is the reason why st sin still exists in church today. A failure to believe, I mean, the verse says it in verse 17 and 18 that Tom read. It says, having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. There's no reason why victory shouldn't be present in church today, right? If we believe in the promise that we've been freed from it. It's really interesting. I just was studying Acts 3 this morning. And I think one of the greatest examples of being free from sin... It was is in actually Acts 3. And as I read that chapter this morning, I decided this might become one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. But briefly, without taking much of your time, no, sure, John sure. and Peter heals the lame man, remember? Mm -hmm. And it creates such a stir. Now this is right after the grandiose experience of Pentecost, and they're back to real, real world now. And they're out and about, and they heal a lame man. Peter grabs his head and stands him up, and this creates such a stir that there's so many people that gather that Peter decides to preach. He takes the opportunity to start preaching. And in verse 14, he's kind of giving it to him. He's kind of becoming Peter again, you know, in this Straight deal. Forward. You know, he, he, he says, so when Peter saw all these people, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? And then you skip on down to verse 14 and he starts telling them, he tells them, you, you put the Savior to death. You guys did it. And then he says, but you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to go free. Now this is the guy that had just denied Christ. 
And he's telling them, you denied him. Apparently, as your verses suggest, we can become so free from sin, we actually forget about our past. And the Lord wants us to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, here is someone that had just denied Christ three times. And it isn't any time at all until he is telling other people that they had denied him. You know, this is no only about shame 50 at all. days. There's only about 50 days from when Peter denied him till this point right here. Yeah, exactly. This was, we don't know how many days after Pentecost this was, so it's 50 plus something. Yes. Probably not very much, though, mm -hmm. you know. Excellent. Who is the one that always wants to remind you of your past, Bob? God can help us forget it. Though. Yes, amen. Satan is the one that accuses us, isn't he? He's always the one that brings up your failures. And then when you make a mistake, he's, he's like, ah, see, you knew you couldn't do it. Why are you even trying? And the fact of the matter is, the Bible's clear. We can't do it. Who can do it, though? We've already read the verse. Christ does all things. If we want to stop this cycle in our lives, the first element that we would need is what? Say that louder. Belief. We would need belief. We would need faith. I've been looking at this hour of ages, page 123. Hmm. Uh, Desire of Ages, page 123, says, He came to make us partakers of the divine nature. Mm. So long as we are united to Him by faith, as you've said, sin has no more dominion over us. I love that. Mm. God reaches for the hand of faith in us to direct it to lay fast hold upon the divinity of Christ that we may experience perfection of character. Excellent. We have become partakers of, of the divine nature. And she's pulling that out of uh, Peter, actually. Peter quotes that, I think, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, I believe. Peter says that. Faith. I want to read to you a, um, a scripture on faith. It's found in Hebrews 12, just after the faith chapter, of course. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author... And the perfecter, or some versions say the finisher of faith. Whose responsibility have we laid on on whether or not you or I have faith? Whose responsibility do we typically put that on? Ourselves. We put it on ourselves. But according to this verse, whose responsibility is it? It's Christ. Christ is not only the author of faith, Faith wouldn't exist if there wasn't Christ. He's the author of faith and He also finishes it and completes it in us. And like Sylvia said a while ago, the more time we spend with Him, the more our faith grows, right? It's time spent with Him. You know, uh, when I first met my wife, I mean, she by no means was a bad person, but I didn't trust her with everything. I wouldn't have just went and told her things, you know, like about myself, about my childhood, Things that I wouldn't tell anybody else. But today, I'm more than happy to tell her those things. Why do you think that is? We've been together 14 years. I trust her. Why do I trust her, though? Because I spend time with her. You know, I drive truck for little Debbie, and then, you know I'm gone for a day or two at a time. Do you think I call her on the phone? Of course I do. I call her. I want to see how her day's going. You know, we talk to each other about what's going on with the kids and things like that. We're constantly communicating. And a lot of times, we'll talk to each other two or three, four times in a day when I'm gone on the phone. But it's the time that we spend talking to each other, sharing with each other, hanging out with each other that has developed this trust that we have with each other. Do you know it's no different than with God either? We, we can't expect to come to church one day a week and trust God, can we? That would be crazy. <laughs> Somebody had a hand up? You t I just wanted to say that you know, the reason that God is the author and finisher of our faith is because He's proven to be trustworthy. Mm. 
He is unchanging. He has always been trustworthy. He, was always, he will always be trustworthy. We can have confidence that what he says he will do. So it's not, it's not like with anyone else because he is the foundation of our faith in that he has proven trustworthy and we know he will be the finisher of our faith because he will always be trustworthy. Excellent. You know, Numbers 23.19 says, God is not a man that he should lie. God will not lie to you. He never has. If he makes a promise, he's more than capable of keeping his promise, isn't he? Well, we've made promises to each other in the past and circumstances happen and although we want to keep those promises, we're unable to at times, right? I mean, I remember, you know, making promises to my kids, you know, we'll do this and we'll, we'll go here. Well, things happen in life and we weren't able to go there. And they're like, but Dad, you promised. It's like, I know, I, I really, I'm sorry. This has happened and we can't do that now. But God is, when He makes a promise to us, He can deliver on His promises, can't He? Let's turn back to Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> Looking at breaking... I guess we're out of time. <laughs> Looking at one of the things I wanted to... Uh, we, we quit at 10.30, is that correct? Huh? <laughs> huh? <coughs> so we need to quit. Let's look at one verse in Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Paul says, Even so, consider yourselves to be what? dead to sin. Now your version may use the word reckon yourselves to be. When Paul uses this word consider or reckon yourselves to be, what, what is he trying to move us into? What does that word consider or what, is, what does reckon mean to us? What is he trying to move us into? A decision. A decision? Okay, it's more than that. A new state of mind. Excellent. What state is that? He's moving us into the realm of, of faith. He's saying believe it. Believe yourself to be dead to sin. Not if you feel it, but believe it because you are in fact dead to sin because Romans 6.6, 6, your old self was crucified with Him. <clears throat> One other verse. I just want to leave you with one last verse. It's Psalms 119.11. It was in your, um, in your lesson study. Psalms 119.11 says, Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. So a daily relationship with Jesus. And we have that through the Bible. Reading the Bible to get to know Jesus better. Praying to Him. Not just to... You know, tell Him when 911's happen in our life, but to get to know Him. Praying to Him to get to know Him better are the things that God has given us so that our relationship and our trust in Him grows. And He will continue to prove Himself trustworthy to us. He's more than happy to prove Himself trustworthy. Have you found that in your life? I found that in my life. He pursues me. I don't know why, because I'm not very... I don't feel like I should be pursued. But God pursues me. He loves me. His forgiveness is endless. And He wants to change me. He doesn't want me to have to keep doing the things that hurt me and hurt others, does He? Let's pray. Father in Heaven, we thank You for the fact that You are always there for us. That You're just a prayer away. You're right there with us with, through Your Spirit, Father, helping us in life. And that You promise us that there will not be a temptation that we cannot endure. And that uh, You also are the one that can do all things. I pray for each one of us, myself included, that our faith and our trust in You continues to grow on a day-by-day -day basis. And we experience victory in our lives. We thank You in Jesus' name. Amen.
well then.
us turn to 563, All That Thrills My Soul. We'll sing the first and the fourth verse. Morning, church family. Oh, I might have turned that off instead of on. No, nope, it's there. Okay. Well, welcome. It's good to have you here. And uh, another beautiful Sabbath day. I, I think October's got to be one of my favorite months when it comes to the seasons and the weather. I, I just love this weather and the season and the trees are turning. And I just want to say welcome. It's good to have you together here today. We have some announcements on the sheet and just invite you to take a look at that especially the things that are coming up this particular week, some of those events, and you can read about that. I want to invite mom to come forward because she's got an announcement about the taste of holidays and uh, some of the planning for that, and I hope you're getting hungry for that event. I received my first set of recipes yesterday. Uh, why am I so excited about that is because I'm the lucky one that gets to put the booklet together, the recipe booklet for the Taste of the Holidays. And so those of you that are planning tables, uh, please uh, work on your recipes real hard. The ones that I received yesterday, oh, it's just a foretaste of what's to come. They are yummy and I'm having a blast. Matter of fact, I started typing them in, I got hungry. So. Be sure to get your recipes to me. Um, I have to have them to uh, Billy and Rose on the 27th. And so that means I've got just about a week to get these done. Uh, it's okay if you want to wait and bring them to me next Sabbath. I'll, uh, I'll have fun Sunday putting them in. <laughs> but get them here just as soon as you can. The quicker the better. And if uh, <coughs> it's difficult for you to hand them to me, let me give you my email address. <clears throat> T O M A, Toma Cash at gmail.com. You can send them to me that way and we'll get them in the booklet for you. Thank you all so much, each one of you that are participating in this. We're really looking forward to it. All right. Very good. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Not only recipes, but those who are doing crafts. If you have any instructions for your crafts that you would like to put into the book, we p we'll put those in too. Thanks. All right. Thank you. I want to make sure I'm not seeing anyone else sitting on front rows that need to make announcements. I, I think we're covered. 
I wanted to share with you a um, thank you card that we received from the Curtis family. And um, it, it says, uh, thank you very much to our church family for all, and I mean all, that you did during the last four weeks. Your love was shown in so many ways and helped make our day special, one we won't forget. Love was shown when Judy took that special picture of my parents on September 9th and then came, uh, and then came hospital visits, prayer, wow, the care bag filled with, to the top, cards, flowers, potluck, veggie burgers for Saturday night, plus that beautiful song at the cross. Your support then and now means so much to us as a family, and we can't ever thank you enough. And then at the top it says, Mom will be missed by all of us. And it's signed by Emer, Carol, and Linda and family. And so I wanted to pass that on, and we'll, we'll pin this up here on the bulletin board for a few weeks. And then Sherry and I would just like to also, during this time of thanks, just say thank you to the church family for your support, for the card and the gift that was given to us last week. And we just want to say thank you. We, we love being your pastor and your pastor's family. And, and so just thank you for your support that you give to us uh, and your encouraging words. And, and so thank you. And, and thank you for, for what you did for us last week. It was very helpful. Well, we're going to continue on with our program, and I left my sheet over there, so I'm not sure what's next. Is it offering that's next? Okay, then it's time for our offering. Good morning. Good morning. Teresa asked me to do this, and I told her no. So I was a little surprised this morning, and I see she's not even here for me to make her regret having done this. <laughs> but maybe we'll make it through this. Ambush, that's right. Would the gentlemen please come forward that I've asked to uh, take up their offering this morning? Since I wasn't prepared last night, something came to mind. Uh, as a religion, we like to think of ourselves as knowing more truth than most of the others out there, and uh, that we are the remnant. And one of the things that always comes to mind whenever I think of that, I don't have a lot of time to do a lot of things, but the least I can do is give my money in these end times because I think most of you have watched the news and you know that we are there. And uh, this keeps coming to my mind. It's Luke 12, 47 and 48. It says, And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. Uh, I don't know about you, but I forget all the time that I've been given far more than almost anyone else I know, and I need to give that back. And so this is one of the few forms that I can. Shall we bow our heads? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day that you've given us. We thank you for all the wonderful things that you've done for us, and we thank you that the time is short and that we can be a part of that end times. We ask that you take the money that we give here today and bless it and multiply it many times to do your will in these final days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Wow, Sylvia, that was fantastic. I love that. Thank you. Can I have somebody help me with these mics? We don't have a very large crowd here, so let's hear what we need to bring before the Lord. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you. Any requests? Well, just um, that God would be with us and send the Holy Spirit in um, before I go into jail ministry today. And then this afternoon after jail ministry, I'm hoping to see if I can find Sandy um, Doyle's wife. And um, I've been there before, and it's been a long time, so I hope I remember where the house is at. I'd like for you all to pray for all of my family because the devil's really working hard. I'd like to pray for Trent and uh, family because he's not doing well. He's not going to make it. He has, you know, we didn't know, we didn't think he'd live this long. Was there this morning and late last night, and his breathing is be just becoming more irregular, but. He just hangs on, but they keep him pretty well medicated because he would be in horrible pain. Mine is not a prayer of request, it's a prayer of gratitude. I want to thank this church so much for praying for me, and I have two words to say. I'm here. This last week, I spent a whole week moving up here, and everything from storage, you know what a nightmare that was. And um, <laughs> I can't even believe it happened. And I just, every time something else would come up, I'd go, okay, Lord, this is one more. I need you again. But he was with me and blessed me, and I'm here, and I'm so grateful to be with you. But your prayers and your attitude toward me about coming here was what really kept me going when it was a little bit tough. But thank you so much. Can we get a mic to Ken? You got a pretty good voice on you, Ken. I'm kind of a loud mouth anyway. <laughs> uh, the aid that comes and gives me a bath and so forth came down this last weekend with strep throat, and she's been really sick, and she asked to have prayer for her. So I would like to, for my aid to have prayer. Okay. How many of us have silent prayers? We've all got loved ones I wish we were here. Go ahead, Nora. You know, we have, if we look at the news, it's kind of depressing. And I was on a business trip this week and shared a room with coworkers. And you know, God uses special moments for us to be still and know Him. And my coworker, every night, called home about bedtime and said her evening prayers with her children every night. Wow. They don't go to my church, our church. But you know, I was impressed. How many of us take time when we're traveling that we would do that? I was pretty impressed. Let's bow our heads. Almighty Father, it's such a pleasure to come before you. We're all here because of our love for you. You have continually provided for, and you have done so much in our lives, Father. And we just thank you. We thank you, and we pray for these requests. And we also pray for Emer. And I just want to thank you for all that you do, and as the world rocks and reels from one crisis after another. We will turn our eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face.
and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.
Thank you for that song. Luke chapter 15 is where we're going to be looking today. And uh, we're going to look again at some of uh, Jesus' parables. And uh, it begins with a very interesting verse. Luke 15 verse 1 says that all the dis despicable, the, the shady people gathered around Jesus. It says the tax collectors and the sinners. You know, the ones from the other side of town. The, the ones that don't have the reputation that you would want your family hanging around with. Uh, these people begin gathering around Jesus. There must have been something about what Jesus said. There must have been something about how Jesus portrayed himself that attracted them to him. They came to hear what he had to say. But verse 2 says that the Pharisees and the scribes complained. They said, this man is receiving tax collectors and sinners. He's allowing them to come in here. They're, they're hanging out in church or spending time with him. How can he do this? How could he focus on these people? And so Jesus replies, and he wants to give in the next three little stories, these parables, he wants to give an impression about how valuable the lost is to God. How valuable the lost is to, to Jesus. Why was he here after all? Wasn't it to save the lost? And so he wants to show the value of a sinner to God. And so we're going to look at these three parables. Let's bow our heads as we begin. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, these parables are stories that we're familiar with, but I pray that as we spend time with them today, that we will understand more about you, your love for us, and how we can respond back to you and your love. Be with us as we look at these. In Jesus' name, amen. The first parable that he speaks to those who were asking, how can you spend time with sinners? He says, who of you who have a hundred sheep and lost one out there in the wilderness wouldn't leave the 99 and go out searching for that lost sheep? And when you find that lost sheep, who wouldn't pick it up and throw it over your shoulders and carry it and come into town and tell everyone, I had lost a sheep, but now it's been found. This one sheep, and you're excited about it because you know the value of that, that little lamb, that sheep that was lost. He goes on in verse 7 to say, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Now, I looked at that for a little bit and I used to think, does that mean that God abandons the church and goes out there looking for the lost? Until I, I, I read that last phrase again to myself. God's more excited about over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. And then I got to thinking, is there any person who doesn't need to repent? No, there's not. Every one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us is a sinner. Every one of us is that lost sheep. So he's actually poking a little fun at those who feel like they don't need to repent. Maybe those who are self-righteous, those who feel pretty good about themselves. He's saying heaven is more excited about those who repent than those who don't. And that makes a lot of sense to me. God sees value in each one of us. And by the way, there's none of us who don't need to repent. The second story goes on in a very similar manner. This time, instead of maybe speaking to the men, maybe he now speaks to the ladies. And he says, what woman of you who has ten coins that loses one doesn't light a lamp and sweep the floor and look around until you find that lost coin? 
And then, when you find that last coin, go out, lost coin, go out and tell your friends, I had lost my coin, and now I have found it. And then he ends, then he ends again with a similar phrase. Likewise, in verse 10, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I was looking up to, to understand a little bit more about this coin and why Jesus uses this particular illustration. And I found something that was very interesting. I guess in the day and the time for Jesus that um, one of the dowries that was given to women at the time of marriage were 10 silver coins that many times they would take and they would put on a garland. And sometimes you might see even pictures of, of the women wearing these on their foreheads. It was an indication that you were married. It may be today in our society and culture, it might be like the wedding band. And, and for them, the 10 silver coins represented a little bit of economic security. If something happened uh, to her husband, something went, she at least had the value of these coins to, to continue on, to take care of the family. Sometimes, in a, in a crisis, they may have to sell some of those coins to take care of the family, but it was there, it was a, it was a, a safety, a security net. And so, imagine that these 10 coins, and the value of each coin was usually about a day's wages. About a day's wages, so 10 days wages is what it is. Not a lot of wealth, but something represented marriage, represented a little bit of security. Well, I got to thinking, how many who have had maybe something valuable in our own lives, maybe a wedding band that, that we were wearing and maybe we set up on the kitchen sink, you know, while we're washing dishes and, and then something happened or maybe we just simply misplaced something important. I told the story about misplacing my iPad a few weeks ago and how we searched for that and, until finally I was so excited I got it and I ended up telling two church congregations how excited I was for finding this iPad. And for this woman, it would be valuable, yes, and she was excited to find it. But what are the points of the story? Jesus is saying that to God, sinners are as valuable as your wedding band or your treasures that you have. In fact, more so. That, it's, that for God, there is value in the lost. And He takes the time to pursue after and search for us. And He keeps searching until He finds us. I love that picture of God. He's answering the question, how is it that you could spend time with sinners? Oh, that we would all be more like Jesus. Oh, that we would see the value of people who have maybe a shady reputation. Oh, that we would see the value of people who are lost, who need to hear the gospel. Oh, that we would get out there and search for them and tell them about Jesus. The third, paragraph, uh, the third parable, starting in verse 11, as a little bit of twist, though he's still answering the question. In this third parable now, he gives it from the perspective of the person who is lost. We've already seen how God values the sinner, but now it kind of gives a response to the sinner. How are we supposed to respond back to God? It's a story that's probably familiar. In fact, of the parables that are preached, this is probably one of the top ones that is shared. The story about a boy who, who asks for his inheritance. As Jesus tells this story, it's as absurd in his culture as it is today. It's as dishonoring to the Father in his culture as it is for somebody to sit around the table while mom and dad is still alive and start debating at Thanksgiving time who's going to get what stuff while they're still there. You know that's rude, right? You know that that's unacceptable to have that conversation. You devalue your parents down to the point that it's only the value of their possessions. And it's not appropriate. And it wasn't appropriate in Jesus' day. But, he says, 
there was a certain man who had two sons and the younger of them came to his father. Now, the firstborn son in those days would have had rights to two thirds of the inheritance as the firstborn and still following the kind of a head of the family type of mentality. And so that they would take care of the family business. The second son would have had access to about one third of the family business. And the younger son comes to his father and says, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And the father divided to them his livelihood. It's interesting that the story says that the father goes along with this and gives to the son what his inheritance is up front instead of waiting for the father to pass, but gives him his money. It says that the young boy takes the, takes the inheritance and he goes to a far country and he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. And before we even go further in the story, I want to take a moment to kind of put us in it so we understand where we are. The inheritance that God gives to us is life. He gives us this life to live. And we have this opportunity. Wow, they're, they're active today. Woohoo! Hi, come join me. Oh, fire engine's gone. God gives us this life that we have, and, and, and we have time as, our, as, as part of our inheritance. And what we do with it, many times we squander it, don't we, in prodigal living. And so this isn't as far-fetched as you would think. But God says, or Jesus goes on and says that he lives a prodigal, with a prodigal living, he wastes his possessions. And when he had spent all, then trouble came. You know, during that time of living, he had lots of friends. I mean, after all, who wouldn't gather together with this man as he's throwing lavish parties and hanging out and spending time down at the yacht club and, and going golfing and picking up the, uh, picking up the cost for everyone? You, you like a friend like that, don't you? Uh, when they're paying for everything, sure, you're going to come along. But the money ran out. And just as the money ran out, an economic crisis hits, a recession hits, a depression hits. The Bible calls it a famine, and it was severe, and uh, many people were without jobs, and they were hungry. He looks around for his friends, but they're all gone now. He had had many people over and ate at his place, but now that he's hungry, there's no one to help him. And so verse 15 says that he goes and he joins himself to a citizen of that country, and that man put him to work in his fields feeding swine. Now Jesus could have used a lot of things here to describe this scene. But for a Jewish person, this is about as bad as it can get. To be forced to maintain an unclean animal when they considered pigs and swine unclean, to have to feed it, and then even worse, to covet the food that you're giving to the swine. Today, if we had an economic crisis in this kind of way, a famine hit our land, this would be giving yourself up to a job that went against all of your values, that went against everything that you believed in. And we could probably name a few of those, but you wouldn't want to support a business that, that participated in activities that you disagreed on, like a strip club or something like that. Can you imagine being forced to work there? It's the only job. And this is what Jesus is describing. Verse 16, And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swan, swine eat, and no one gave him anything. And then verse 17, But when he came to himself, this is kind of like, finally this young man has matured. 
Finally, he looks at himself and where he is in life and what he has squandered and what he has left. When he finally comes to himself and wises up, now he can start to reason. We kind of do that in our lives. We go along, we're tripping along and having a good time, and sometimes we're squandering the very thing that God's given us until finally we run headlong into trouble, and then we finally wake up and we come to ourselves. And it says, when he came to himself and started to really think, he started to think about his father's, his father's home, his homeland. And he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and despair, and I perish with hunger. Now there are two kinds of servants in those days that could be talked about, and then there's slaves. That, but of the servants, there would be those who were hired to be with the family all the time, lived on the farm, lived with the family, probably in the, the main house, and was really counted as part of the family. Those were the, the servants that were there year round. That's not who he's talking about. He doesn't even see himself as qualifying for that level of a servant. But rather, there was another group of servants that would be hired in, maybe at the time of harvest, or when you're shearing the sheep and you've got a lot of work to be done, you would hire on extra hands just for a small temporary time. Temp workers. And he says, you know, even those who come in on a temporary basis, who don't even live with the family, they're doing better than what I'm doing. And he decides, I'm going, to, I'm going to go home, and I'm not going to ask to be the son. I don't deserve that. I'm not going to ask to be even one of the family servants that are there year round. But if, if dad would just hire me temporarily, just as a hired servant, maybe I could have enough to eat. And so he decides this plan. Have you ever talked to yourself and made a, uh, made a, made a plan? Have you ever thought to yourself, oh, uh, you know, I want to say these words when I meet this person, and you rehearse it over. I, I remember when Sherry and I were dating, and I came to that, that time where I thought that I was going to ask her to marry me. And I had set up the, the horse-drawn carriage in Lincoln, Nebraska, downtown, and had set up the time with her to, to get together and go down there. She didn't know I was going to ask her that night. And during that day, I remember rehearsing all the things I wanted to say. And then I got there in the carriage, and I didn't say any of the things I wanted to say. I think at some point I did ask if we could get married, and I'm sure she said yes, um, but it wasn't anything that I'd rehearsed. Have you ever been there? <laughs> this young man has rehearsed what he's going to say to his father. In verse 18, he says, I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and he decided, yep, that's what I'm going to do. And he started to make his way to his father's house. But while he was a great way off, while he was still a long ways out, the Bible talks about the father and how undignified he was. Because it says while he was still a way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran to meet him. I want to tell you, in the Middle Eastern culture today, as it was in Jesus' day, for elderly men to run, it's considered undignified. They don't do it. Even in times of danger, they'll walk quickly, but they won't run. And yet Jesus says that when the Father sees the Son coming while He's away off, He runs to meet Him. He's making a point. This is how anxious the Father was to be with His Son. This is how anxious God is to be with us. And it says that he ran and he fell on his neck and he kissed him. And now the son begins coming back and he says, And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to call, be called your son. But before he finishes, the father interrupts him. Oh, I love this scene, what the father does. In the little book, Christ Object Lessons, 
and this is something very important to remember, before the son even came to his father, he didn't know how his father was going to react here. But before he even came, he made a decision, I'm, I'm going to go as I am. Now think about how he was. He'd been feeding the swine. He was dirty. He was filthy. His clothes were probably torn. He, he didn't look at all like the son who had walked away with so much wealth. There was very little left. And in Christ Object Lessons, it says, Do not listen to the enemy's suggestion to stay away from Christ until you have made yourself better, until you are good enough to, to come to God. If you wait until then, you will never come. I love that phrase. Don't wait to come to the Father until you've gotten yourself cleaned up, because you'll never come. It just won't happen. This boy has decided to come home. His father has run out and he has grabbed him and it says that he's fallen on him and kissed him. This dirty boy who has squandered the family wealth, is, he's kissing him and he starts to do more. I think this is one of the reasons he meets the son while he's way out there. He's not home yet. And he says to one of the servants, go get, go get my good coat. Get my good robe. We're going to put that on him. I don't want anyone to see him dressed like this. He doesn't want him to be embarrassed. So he puts on his robe. And then he, then he does something else. It says he takes the signet ring off his finger and puts it on the sun. Today, it would be like taking out the family credit card or debit card. We don't use credit cards, right? The debit card to do transactions for the, uh, for the family, to give them durable power of attorney for financial, for the family. He signs the papers right there by giving the signet ring. He says, I, don't want to, I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't want to hear it. Because you're my son. And so he puts on this beautiful robe and he gives him financial uh, action. He gives him the right to do action for the family, financial transactions. Bring the best robe, 22, and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And then he says, here's another thing I want to do. Son, you stay right here. I'm going to stay right by you. So he starts sending the other servants. He says, I want you to go back to the house. I want you to prepare a celebration, a party. Go kill the fatted calf. Go prepare everything. Because what we're going to do is when it's all ready, you give us a wave from over at the house. And when everyone's gathered, and then we're going to come walking in with the son wearing this beautiful robe. Here he is. My son has returned. And it's my son, not a servant. And so they go back and they prepare for the party and everyone gathers and now here comes the father with the son back home. And they celebrate because the son who was lost has come back home. Oh, that's our story. That's our story. God has done that for us. When we turn and come back to Him, He runs to meet us. He covers us with His robe of righteousness. And then He prepares a, a celebration. And you know, one day, He's going to come and, 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 uh, 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 and usher us all back with Him, those who are righteous. We're all going to come back home with Him. And there the table is going to be laid out. And He's going to serve us. And it's going to be a wonderful day. And heaven is going to celebrate. But remember where it started, these parables. Remember who Jesus is talking to. And he wants to give one more lesson to them. And so he talks about the older brother. It says, now the older brother was in the field. And as he came in, and you can imagine it's the end of a hard day. He's been out there working, and, and it's been a good day. It's been a productive day. But you know what it's like, that you're tired and you're coming in, and he looks up, and there the house is filled with candles and lamps, and there's a whole bunch of horses and other things out front, and, and it looks like a crowd of people milling in and out of the house, and he goes, what's going on? What's this party about? And so he catches somebody as they're scurrying by with maybe a big vase of grape juice or something. Well, what's going on? What, what's and, and he's told. The celebration is happening because your younger brother has come home. 
and your father is throwing a celebration. Come on in. It's, it's the best party we've ever had. But the, but the older brother is angry. And it says that he would not go in in verse 28. So what does the father have to do? He goes out to meet him and to talk to him. And it says that he pleads with him. And the older brother answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours, you can almost hear that. Those who's in this uh, uh, resolving conflict uh, seminar that we're doing, you hear that. This son of yours, it's your problem you're doing has devoured your livelihood with harlots, and you killed the fatted calf for him. And the father replies, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. For those of us, who have grown up Christians. For those of us who have always been in an environment where Christ is around, sometimes we're tempted to feel a little bit like the older brother. Look at the one who's gone out there and partied and been in the world and did drugs and did alcohol and all this other stuff. Look at them and now they want to come back into our church. We tend to be a little bit like the older brother. I want to tell you, though, I've talked to a lot of the younger brothers and sisters who have been out there and done those things. And their story always has the same conclusion. If I could do it over again, I wouldn't do it. If I could go back and change it, I would, I would undo what I've done. I wished I hadn't experienced those things. That thing that looked so attractive turned out to be so painful in my life. I've talked to a lot of the younger brothers and sisters, and we can be excited, those of us who haven't experienced it, when somebody like that finds their way back home. We need to be excited and celebrating. Christ Object Lessons goes on to say, When you see yourselves as sinners, saved only by the love of your Heavenly Father, you will have tender pity for those who are suffering in sin. When we see ourselves as sinners who have been saved, when we realize that the Father has thrown the party for us when we've come into a relationship with Him, he says, now we will start to value those who still aren't there. And I want to encourage us as we close, let's celebrate when someone makes a step towards the Father. Let's go out and seek them as we would for a lost iPad or a lost wedding ring. Let's not stop looking for them until we have reached everyone with the message of the gospel. Now, not everyone will accept, but that's not ours to worry about. Our job is to seek and to share and to celebrate for those who accept. Let's bow our heads. Lord, thank you for this, these parables. Thank you for the lessons we've learned. And as we continue today worshiping you, I pray that you will bless, bless us. May we learn these lessons and apply it in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now don't leave.